Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Open Active Adoption Engagement Forum for Friday, the 3rd of February, 2023. Uh, great to see everyone here. Um, I'll just quickly uh, move on to the usual first slide for anyone new to the call or anyone who is watching on the recording. Um, just a reminder to please join us in our Open Active Slack workspace, which is the best place to keep up to date with everything going on with the community. Um, particularly around uh, these meetings, the Adoption Engagement Forum, and also the, the W3C group, which also meets fortnightly um, and looks at update, updates to the standards and um, anything related to the more kind of technical side of side of the initiative. So yeah, please, please do join us. And if you're watching the recording, um, a link to these slides will be uh, in the description at the, at the bottom underneath the recording, and uh, you can click through these links um, to get to all, all the relevant places. And a quick uh, look at what we've got on the agenda for today. Um, so we'll have a, a quick round of introductions. We've got a couple of new people. So just have a just for the benefit of, um, of them and for anyone watching the recording, it'd be great to uh, quick introduction for everyone. Um, and then uh, we've got a steering committee update from Charlie. Um, recently held the first uh, steering committee meeting of the new year. So just a quick update from Charlie on that. And then we've got Sophia here from the ODI's team who's going to be looking through some policy engagement work that she's been working on so that should be really interesting and then we've got Tom uh, here from Plaid who's got an update on a few uh, new activity finders that he's been working on through his work so it should be a really good agenda so yeah just quickly a quick round of introductions to start with just for, for the benefit of anyone new and, and anyone watching the recording and um, so I'll start my name is Tim Corby I'm an engagement consultant at the Open Data Institute and i um, part of the ODI's team that is helping to steward the Open Active Initiative. If I can go to you first, Adam. Yeah, sure thing. Hi there, uh, Adam Freeman-Pask. I work at Sport England. I'm head of digital innovation and I uh, look after projects like Open Active, Digital Marketing Hub, Digital Maturity Work um, and the Innovation Digital Accelerator we've been doing with a group of the Birmingham Commonwealth Games NGBs. So that's me. Great, thanks, Adam. Uh, Sophia? Hello, um, I'm Sophia. I'm working at the ODI and um, where we're uh, stewarding the Open Active Standard and I'm on the research, uh, the policy work stream. Um, and yeah, uh, just looking forward to speaking to you today. Great, thanks, Sophia. Um, Charlie, can I come to you next? Sorry, you're furiously scribbling. <laughs> Always making notes. Uh, Charlie Merrick Clark, uh, commercial director at Playfinder and Book Tech, and also representing from steering committee. Great, thanks, Charlie. Uh, Tom. Hi everyone. Tom, co-founder of Blade, um, creating kind of open active, open data powered search booking payments tools, and yeah, happy to see you all. Thanks, Tom. Uh, David, you next. Hi, I'm David Dinage. I'm the head of communications at the ODI. So I do um, lots of work uh, on open active around the communications plan and gathering case studies and that kind of thing and social media accounts. Sweet. Thanks, David. Uh, Dan, can I come to you next? Yeah, uh, Dan Smith, uh, newly appointed into a partnerships lead role at um, Open Data Services. So yeah, I'm here to kind of bridge the gap between our technical experts and the community and just look for opportunities and ways we can support the standards where it's open referral open active and so on so yeah nice to meet everybody great thanks dan great to have you with us today uh geraldine hi good morning everyone so i work for yorkshire sport foundation um, and i'm the data and insight manager great thanks and i think that neatly lead on to jules next it would wouldn't it <laughs> hi i'm jules yorkshire Sport foundation I've uh, been with them since before Twitter, and I've been having open active conversations for about seven years now, so having fun. Great, thanks Jules. Uh, Chris? Morning everyone, hi, Chris Bancroft, uh, the data management <coughs> specialist here at the ODI working on the open active initiative, uh, mainly working in the data infrastructure work stream. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and then finally, uh, an, a trio of Iman. I think we've got uh, Nish, if we could go to you first. Thanks, Chris. Hi, yeah, Nish Desai from Iman, uh, and I also sit on the steering committee with Charlie. 
Happenings Nish, uh, Dom. Yep, sorry, trying to find the unmute button. Uh, hi, Dom from IMIN, uh, co founder and kind of more focused on the account side of things. Thanks, Dom. Now over to Nick. Yeah. Nick, if you could come to, come to you, please. Yeah, uh, Nick from IMIN, also here. Great. Thanks, everyone. That's, uh, that's really useful, I think, just for everyone to uh, get flavour who's who's on the call. So uh, first up on the agenda, we've just got a quick steering committee update from Charlie. So if I could come to you uh, first, please, Charlie, if that's OK. Um, yeah, no problem at all. Um, so um, steering committee met week uh, before last, if not next week. I'm losing track of my dates, things moving so quickly. Um, uh, to manage expectations, it was very much a uh, first steering committee introducing new members some of which are brand new to the initiative um so there was a need to go through rightly so the sort of plotted history and journey that that open active has been on since it's it's founding and inception um, and make sure some of the principles of the last two or three years of looking at sustainability um evidence of the report etc were discussed and, and put on radars so that we um can hit the ground running hopefully in in future meetings um uh some of the things that were perhaps more tangibly discussed other than uh, sort of introductions and making those baby steps uh, was were the importance of use cases um, to prove value for the initiative in the in the very short term. I think the awareness that we've got in in startup terms a very short runway of funding at the moment um, and the need to sort of evidence and provide provide evidence of um, of value of the initiative in order to attract not just more funding from uh, the, the the current uh, majority fund of Sports England but but our funders is going to be absolutely essential and so that work stream playing a pivotal role uh, as do all the work streams but perhaps right in the right at the center um, but also the need for the uh, sort of the priority of policy and the intersection of policy um, and use use cases um, in we, the, the potential need for for more and better policy intervention to drive the success of those use cases and vice versa use cases perhaps uh, being hard to get off the ground from the bottom up without without that policy intervention so um, hopefully that's it's a short summary of the, of the importance of those two but um, hopefully gives people the us as a community confidence that steering committee recognizing that we need to prove that value and we know um maybe more than ever the importance of policy to drive that to drive that value um if not doing it on its own um uh, i think when i talk about policy there it, what I want to represent from a steering committee discussion perspective is we're not simply talking about um, uh, policy intervention in contracts and agreements, particularly in leisure, which has had a lot of discussion before, very much including that. I wouldn't want to say it's anything that any less that's any less diminished. I think that remains heavily, hugely important. Um, but I think we're looking at how uh, perhaps in the longer term, as well as the shorter term, we can use policy as, as a vehicle, perhaps nationally with putting um, open active onto the national data international data infrastructure conversation as the way to get the long-term benefit of, of uh, policy intervention that any funding that comes centrally from government open active is simply uh, tr simply and truly embedded um, but then with use cases that we might do in the short term we need to have a, a close look at what policy interventions we can use to act to guarantee as best as possible um, the value from those use case pilots and projects uh, i think lisa allen particularly from a um from an ODI perspective, and I don't think this is any one individual's job, but I think Lisa particularly could provide a lot of value in that in that government conversation from what I'm understanding of her contacts, connections and experience. So um, uh, looking forward to seeing what Lisa can bring to the table um, from an ODI representation perspective as well. Um, uh, we also discussed the real importance in the in the sort of 12 month uh, period we've got now of, of guaranteeing the the future legal entity of open active um, from a who will not just who will own the assets and be responsible for maintaining the assets um, but um, how do we sort of make make simpler that central decision making power for open active um, i think steering committee is really clear that there is still that um that uh, complexity of having a steering committee having a single majority funder in sport england um, and having the odi as the lead steward and not to say that's a model that isn't working but we know we need to simplify that model and, and be able to have a, a central decision making power and owner um, where hopefully those those the community sport england as a funder and the odi are already providing the value into that um into that decision making rather than sort of being at the center of it per se if that's the best way to describe that um 
And, and the only other thing I think I can think to mention, unless Adam and Nish call me out and say, Charlie, you've forgotten this, this and this, um, would be um, in terms of chairing the steering committee from here on in, um, Substance and ODSC have now stepped away from the, the initiative um, and the steering committee agreed um, through a, a subtle voting mechanism on a kind of rolling chair model. Um, so Eugene Minogue, um, who's got experience in Open Active as a champion, as well as from Westminster and, and through other touch points, in his um, local government work will chair for the next two months um, and then there'll be a rolling chair um, for the steering committee from, from there on in from other members of the steering committee. And I think that is hopefully summarising what was a two, two and a half hour first session of the new steering committee. Fantastic. Thank you, Charlie. I think that's really helpful. And I guess just to say, I think I'm right in saying, Charlie, that you've sort of agreed in an informal way to be a bit of a liaison between the AEF group and the steering committee. So I guess if anyone um, from an AEF context has anything they'd like to raise at the steering committee or any issues or anything, then, you know, please, please do get in, in touch with Charlie. Um, I don't know if Adam or Nish has anything to add to that or if anyone has any questions for Charlie. Uh, Dan. Um, yeah, Charlie, can I just ask whether uh, uh, minutes are shared from the steering committee with the broader community? Yes, they they are. Um, where they're exactly published, I actually don't know off the top of my head, um, but I should do. Um, but Julie King, um, who's sort of secretary at, at the committee, is publishing everything um, uh, from minutes agenda, etc. Adam, I don't know whether you know better where those are actually being being put. Uh, just because I don't know right now, I can easily dig into my emails. Yeah, she's she's got a good. Uh, good Google Doc structure, isn't she? But I'm assuming there's a link going to be on the website somewhere for that. But yeah, uh, Dan, it, it will be transparent in terms of getting a, getting sight of the discussion topics and, and what was progressed at the steering committee. Okay, I'll, I'll have a I'll have a dig around, and if not, I'll. Uh, well, while we're on the call, I'll try and find them for you because I'm sure they're in our emails and linked from the place that they are public publicly available as well. Uh, I think um, possibly just to add to that, that I think Judy is in the process of improving that uh, a process of how easy it is to find them, because I, th I think although they are open and public, they're not necessarily that easy to find at the moment. So <laughs> I think that is a kind of watch this space where, um, yeah, that is something that Judy is working on and, and making that much easier for people to find. Great, thank you. I think um, only other thing I'd add is I know that there's been some comms that's gone out around the new steering committee. So I don't know if David, if you could quickly just say what if people are interested in in reading about the new steering committee members and, and those updates, where's the best place for them to find that? Yeah, so we shared those via the Open Active LinkedIn um, page. So you can find the links to the um message through that and what i'm going to do over the next few weeks as well is the biographies and, and photos that people submitted um we'll put those out on linkedin as a kind of like introducing committee uh, steering committee members find out a little bit more because those biographies aren't on the website obviously so that we'll we'll put those out through um through the linkedin page as well and twitter over the next few weeks unless anyone has any objections then tell me <laughs> but you've everyone submitted it so i'm assuming it's fair game great thank you david yeah so i guess just uh keep, keep an eye on those open active social channels so that's uh linkedin and um and twitter and uh yeah be able to find out a bit more a bit more information about all the all the new steering committee members fantastic uh in which case i think we'll move on to the next part of the agenda which is going to be led by sophia so i'll just uh share my screen again because sophia has some slides and oh sorry dan you've got um your hand up again yeah i'm, I'm so sorry i've got to go and pick my daughter up from school because she's not well um so i'll um, i'll see you guys later but if anybody's want to check in with me kind of personally then then you know set up a chat then feel free to shoot me an email but i'll also catch up on this on the youtube page okay no worries dan thanks for joining thanks, us thanks. 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 Bye 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 okay so yeah over to you sophia if you're ready great thanks um so yeah i think uh this feeds in quite well to what charlie was um bringing up about the policy 
um, sort of priorities of Open Active. So today I particularly want to talk about our positioning within the sort of national and international data infrastructure that you're talking about there. Um, and sort of uh, doing a little bit of a briefing on the type of research that we've been doing um, at the ODI and um, sort of looking, to, so sharing outwards with you guys and also looking to hear from um, you as the community in terms of building our understanding on how we might understand our positioning in this in this wider policy context. Um, so firstly, just to introduce a sort of means of grouping our, our positioning um, on the basis of some initial research, I sort of sectioned out six different sectors that Open Active is particularly aligned with. Um, so health, education and youth, data and digital infrastructure, communities and transport. So it would include things like leveling up um, disability and then sport and activity, which was obviously kind of transcends various areas of, of policy as well. Um, so uh, yeah, by exploring our alignment, all of these sectors, we're sort of um, looking to share information with the community on, on what the opportunities might be. Um, but towards the end, I'll just open up an opportunity for questions and comments on these different sectors that I've raised. So please do feel free to to give your input there. Um, next slide, please, Tim. Um, so in terms of policy stakeholders, we're looking quite broadly. So from government departments to all the different sections of the NHS um, that are relevant to nonprofits and then sort of government sponsored research units and internationally as well, um, and maybe even commercial partners in the sector, although I don't have anyone represented in this, in this image. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the existing uh, priorities in the health sector, we're well aligned with, with governance priorities. So um, it's already pretty well recognized both within the NHS and within central gov government that it's really important that there's a strong data infrastructure um, and that we need data standards supporting health services um, with the view to sort of reliable data and also services that are able to join up. So that's a, that's a clear priority. The NHS already has their own data standards directory um, as does central government, for example. Um, and yeah, obviously uh, prevention and health inequalities are at the forefront of the NHS long-term long -term plan. Um, and then in terms of the priorities that came about as a result of the recovery from COVID-19. There's also um, particular interest at the moment in lack of access to green space, social isolation, mental health, and the health outcomes associated. Um, I've just realized that I didn't mention the reason that I'm discussing health, the health sector um, today, which is only that um, this is the sort of first, first area to present or to, to share information with the community, but we will be looking through all of these different policy sectors, um, but particularly in view of uh, our sort of potential alignment with uh, the health sector, just meetings that we've been having recently with the NHS. Um, so yeah, next slide please, Tim. Uh, so broad use case areas that we've already identified or been discussing in the sector in our uh, social prescribing. Uh, so we may be able to work together with a network of standards and supporting social prescribing, but also um, there may be clinical referral opportunities on other levels, including um, some interest in uh, pre and postnatal referral, for example. Um, and in the sector, uh, there's kind of consistent research findings to suggest that social prescribers are lacking um, awareness of which activities may be available in their communities. Um, and also um, findings on a need to be able to trust that information on opportunities is up to date and that services will meet different needs of patients. Um, so these are kind of opportunities for Open Active to be aware of and um, to maybe tap into in terms of uh, use case development. 
Um, and next slide, please, Tim. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to very briefly run through the sort of top level in terms of our alignment in, in the health sector and to introduce these six different um, sort of uh, categories um, and to open the floor to discussion questions. Um, and so yeah, feel free to feed in on any of these questions here, but also more broadly to be in touch with your own updates, ideas, questions. Um, with us at the ODI. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. That's that's really interesting. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions for Sophia or any comments or thoughts. Um, open the open the floor up. Yeah, the uh, social prescribing is something we've been looking at because it seemed to be an audience group that might actually be worth investigating. Uh, but we're just looking into that at the moment, just trying to work out how to contact them and work out what it is they actually want. And then how do we get this, this information? It kind of ties in with the, the campaign tag question I was going to ask later. Of If you have a social prescriber, they may be looking for things that are specifically tailored for not particular public facing sessions. I say people dealing with uh, drug problems, other kinds of things. Uh, and a campaign tag would be a way of filtering those so you could only see those that were able to cope with that kind of uh, subscription. Yeah, I think um, that's the kind of, those are the kind of broad discussions that we're having at the moment. And, and whether, I think in terms of use cases, the question is always, uh, are there kind of is it the basic standard that is, is is already kind of prepared or are there additional elements that need to be included in the standard to support different patient groups as well I think it also brings back to the other thing that they did ask for is they wanted to just have a list of organizations and the whole club finder thing is missing from open active it's only about the sessions it's not about the organizations which seems to be a a huge gap because we started with a club finder you know 15 16 years ago and that's always been there and that activity has been new if someone doesn't have an activity going on at the moment they seem to disappear off the radar and so certainly social prescribers may need to go i need to talk to these people first and work out if this is the right thing before i start sending people over so i'm wondering how the active referral thing with those two systems could be open together to each other so you have a an, act, an organization finder and an activity finder. I think that's a really interesting point. It really relates to the trust element. Thanks, Sophia. I was just going to add in um, from my side that, yeah, I think there's, there's quite a clear opportunity within social prescribing. And I think what's not clear uh, is what that user journey truly looks like. So from someone in a certain role, what like how would it go from having a conversation with someone to them searching or finding a suitable activity i think that's a little bit unclear and i think going this is fairly granular in terms of how the data standards work but i don't think it's clear from like an actual journey like i've got some indication of how it would work but if there was more clarity on like okay what are like, can we actually sit down, talk to people that are doing social prescribing and just really understand at a, a high level how they want to be able to um, how they want to be able to achieve that and then drill down and understand how open active can support it better? Because I do think that that's crucial and something that we we often miss when we get too much into the detail. Another, another thing was mentioned there was the case of trust. And that is a big question that have been asked by social prescribers is whenever so you Google something, Google doesn't trust anything. It just shows you everything that's out there. It would be something you could maybe use the campaign tag to have a, a thing of saying, this is a trusted su supplier for, so you could feel safe sending people. So when someone has actually been assessed, they could be trusted and they could be a trusted activity finder for a cer certain set of topics. Yeah, I think for, all these use cases, the most valuable thing we can do if we're going into new ones is to actually um, speak to people um, with that specific problem before we kind of drill deeper. Yes.
And Tom, you're you're talking about speaking to speaking to social prescribers, speaking to people yeah. maybe higher up than that as well. Yeah, because obviously people on this call, we have a certain perspective, but we're not actually doing we're not actually mm. doing the social prescribing and my perspective and everyone else's here is is different. And you can kind of I I tend to hear stuff via someone else rather than directly. And um feel like we can understand it but things like Jules mentioned like what's the level of trust that they need to be able to actively use a tool like this or or promote a specific provider what's the level of detail that they need how does it need like what's the wording that they would intuitively search for is it like help this person lose weight and then how does that play into it is it help them be more flexible etc um I think that's to be told and would be a good starting point. Speaks to what Charlie was saying at the beginning of the meeting as well, like building on that existing evidence base, that there is already an evidence base on physical activity opportunities and social prescribing, but building on that in terms of what Open Active might be able to offer more specifically. Agreed. Yeah. We can prioritise better if we have those insights as well. Brilliant, thank you. Really interesting um, discussion there. Uh, has anyone else got any uh, thoughts or comments on um, on this area? If we have the time, maybe it would be interesting to bring up that that first slide about the policy sectors and and see if anyone has any particular comments they'd like to feed in. Sure, I can do that. Maybe not. Just say fine. We are trying to look at uh, markets other than the general public in terms of who's going to use these finders. So that's the data angle, the discussion about, or is it more broad than that? Uh, I'm a bit distracted. My Mac has just died. So I've switched to my phone. And I'm watching nervously as it tries to rebuild itself. So, I'm, yeah, forgive me if I'm a little. Uh... <laughs> but yeah, uh, we look at the activity finders. We've been pushing it for a while, but it still doesn't seem to have this take up. We can't get the local authorities to open up theirs after all this time. Uh, XN won't do it. Gladstone will do, but no one seems really keen. And the fact we've got nine districts and none of them have really opened up is is just making us wonder how it's all going to go so we start looking for alternatives or well, who else other than the general public are going to use finders and then started using other like, the health and the social prescribers that seemed to be a kind of a themed finder using that campaign tag idea that you could just say well like, what about losing weight how could people be referred to that seemed to be a targeting a group that actually need it rather than the whole kind of here go find somewhere to be active Thanks, Jules. I've just noticed as well that, that Nish has put a couple of comments in in the chat, which I'll um, I'll read out just for the benefit of anyone who's watching watching the recording and might not be able to access it. So, um, Nish has referenced a report uh, and a kind of pilot that London Sport did around social prescribing and open data. So, um, there's some insights to be to be gleaned from that, and also that uh, I, there's some previous research from. Um, ODSC and, and ODI as well so we're not quite starting from um, from zero on that side of things well, we do have some some uh, evidence already uh, David you've got your hand up yeah so I don't know if anyone's aware but um, <clears throat> I think about two years ago now we we put out a tool uh, for social prescribing I'm going to read the description because I can't you know, honestly say that I know off the top of my head what it is. Um, so it says this new tool shows that factors that could lead to the demand for social prescribing by English authorities uh, uh, with these factors, including everything from teenage drinking to isolation to child poverty to back pain. So th this tool that we put out two years ago has currently been updated and we're actually going to push out a new version of it next week. Um, so we're taking part in the State of Open conference on Tuesday and Wednesday. So 
it will be talked about and launched there and then available the new updated tool will be available um on the back of that so there is a bit of a link thanks david i should just say um say there that the the we is uh, the odi uh i think ollie has joined us actually from london sports so i don't know if Oli, you are available to speak, or if there's anything you could add about the report that Nish has referenced in the chat. Um, but if you're if you're not on mic, then no worries. Hi Tim, yeah, sorry I'm late. Um, I, I don't necessarily have much to add, but I would say go to the London Sport website and you can download all of the assets. There's a, a final report. There's um, there's a video we created, um, and there's it, a document called the 11, uh, 11 unmet needs, which looks at different aspects that need to be included, thought about when looking at social prescribing. Um, so yeah, on, on our website, you can find out so you'll get all of the assets there. And Chris Norfield is the best person to speak about if you want any more detail on that, on that report. Thanks, Ollie. That's, uh, that's very useful. I'll try if I can. Um you put the link in the in the description of the of the meeting recording um so yeah anyone watching the recording if you if you look in the description hopefully there will be a link <laughs> okay if uh, there's no other comments to add i think we can maybe move on um we'll just talk slowly just in case anyone has any last minute thoughts but it looks like no one is poised to jump in so and um, next up on the agenda we have tom who's got a few uh, new projects that he's been working on um we've played uh, so yeah over to you tom if that's okay hi well thanks tim um apologies i had a very strong coffee before this call so if i'm uh, talking a bit fast um apologies um so yeah essentially we've over the last six months, there's been uh, various organizations who have embraced Open Active and, and we've started working with um, through our Activity Finder product. Just wanted to share a few of them and just highlight kind of what the benefits or how, how we can better leverage um, some of this additional uh, interest in Open Active. So, yeah, over the last six months, so these are people that have either recently launched or are about to launch. Activity finders powered by open data. So that's Active Black Country, Somerset Sports and Activity Partnership, Yorkshire Sport, who Jules and Geraldine are on the call today. And we should get more of these on the call today. That's that's something that I'll take away um, to feed into this engagement side. Uh, Sport Birmingham and their local partners, uh, Active Humber, North Yorkshire Sport, Energize Me, which is Hampshire and Isle of Wight, they're kind of doing something before. Um, and Badminton England as well, who are, we're using open data, we're working with them now and we've got some ambitious plans in, in how to scale that up. Um, so that kind of joins existing customers um, who are using open data, London Sport, Active Essex, Together Active, Red January, Heart Sport Partnership, Port of London Authority, and a few more. Basically, the benefit of these organizations kind of engaging with open active more and coming on board is that there's essentially a number of people on the ground advocating for open active speaking to local providers um kind of who have a good understanding of their landscape whether it's regionally whether that's within a specific sport or domain um apologies um and so yeah what i think this enables things to do is to like a good thing about the sport and physical activity industry it's quite network driven so um tapping into network effects within these organizations so whether they be active partnerships ngps uh other bodies what they can do is essentially help spread and and, and you can see it spreading quite quickly in terms of the interest and how that has knock-on effects um so what i think the key challenges are still for a lot of our customers is on the engagement side. I don't think there's enough clarity on kind of how they can engage with different types of local providers to ask them to open their data. So there's still a lot of opaqueness when it comes to like 
what are the bigger local authority or leisure operators doing management systems it's still not super clear like who's doing what um, at the nuance of like okay they use gladstone but they use a specific version of it that they can't open the data and then it's kind of drills down across the whole space i think to me that's where i see the friction is adoption from a provider side i think there's like clearly a end user use case um, that we can see through our data um, that people have success when using activity finders um, to actually find and book onto activities. I think the key thing that we want to help support is to simplify or get that kind of supply side um, as that's that kind of customer acquisition or supply acquisition as smooth as possible. But yeah, I think the kind of more organizations that are kind of advocates within their network are well prepared to advocate for open active um, and are able to kind of be that local kind of champion or that's where we're seeing quite a lot of, of quick growth within that space and there's a number of other organizations will be launching um, open active powered products in the next couple of months as well so yeah, just wanted to share some of that and a bit of a call for anyone to to help support any of those organizations or get in touch if you have any ideas about how we can kind of leverage that to um, benefit open active as a whole cheers tom yeah just an initial thought on that i i'd um actually some colleagues through um some of the work in Birmingham shared those a couple of those finders, so particularly Active Birmingham's one and the Black and the Black Country Moving one, uh, and it, yeah, really exciting to see those sort of things develop and allow those regions to have somewhere of surfacing um, the, the open data. Right, um, it was all re also really interesting to see. I guess as part of rolling out those um, finders, they are trying to do like quite good drop in sessions for 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 local providers in the area to learn a bit more about open data or to start on their journey to sort of opening up. Um, I haven't been to any of those drop ins yet myself. But I know, for example, for the Active Birmingham one, they've got a couple of sessions coming up. Uh, I think next week actually. Um, and I was just wondering if yeah. Are they, are they effective enough to, you know, do they sort of, yeah, it, it, obviously, I mean, I mean, that's one intervention to help helping people open data, but yeah, I just, just be keen. Are you involved most, Tom, in delivering those? Was that, is that more led by the active partnership? So I'm not as involved in the kind of data side of things on those specific projects. I know that um, Nish and Nick and the guys that I'm in are much more involved in, in, in that side of things. Um, but yeah. I think there's been some effective approaches that have been um, more recent approaches to things like those drop-in sessions, things like um, lead gen through forms, et cetera, that have been successful in those areas specifically. Um, I think where we see them being as effective as possible is buy-in from local partners, like um, in a couple of those that you mentioned in Birmingham, Black Country, what they've done well is from the start, it's been a project with local authorities in the area. Um, and then that obviously amplifies the people that are um, making things happen. And so going back to what kind of Jules was talking about and Geraldine earlier in Yorkshire is that how do we get partners to buy in like to a kind of regional based approach and kind of work together opposed to working against each other where we've seen that happen in the past and that just obviously creates problems but yeah uh, i mean if nish or nick, nick want to jump in or dom either um to talk about some of that work that you're doing feel free to uh, jump in if they don't want to jump in i'll just give you an update adam on so we're running a session in march in bradford so we're working with um, Tim from Public Health. So we've got a session with local club and society. So we're in an online session in the day and then one at night to talk through the benefits, how it would happen. So that'll be our first kind of real life communication um, with people in Bradford. So we're going to use that as a bit of a test base before we then move it out into the other districts. So we can, yeah, definitely feedback how that session goes. Oh, that'd be that'd be great, Geraldine. Like it's one of those things that like, 
you know, in theory, this is all a really good project, but, but it requires a lot of a lot of organisations to all kind of commit to, to helping build the feed, doesn't it? Um, yeah, Dom, you came off mute there. So I guess, are you involved in delivering those Birmingham sessions? And I guess, yeah, what has the feedback been through with the, the other finders that you've done in those in terms of how effective those types of sessions were? Um, yeah, thanks, Adam. And thanks for jumping in, Geraldine, when there was just a, a, a long silence. My headphones weren't plugged in, so I was talking. Um, I explained everything. Um, but yeah, so uh, I'm Dom from Iman. Um and yeah, we so this is as Tom intimated. So we work with with played on on uh, some of the findings he's mentioned, um, notably uh, the Sport Birmingham one, so the Active Birmingham, and it's part of a pro provider outreach work we do um, empirically over the kind of you know the, the number of years that we've been involved in this and and open and active. We've realised that the the two kind of go hand in hand. It's it's kind of hard to move into an area and deploy something search related without kind of stimulating uh the opportunities in the area so we find that in reality they really work they work well together so yes with birmingham we've gone in and we've got a, a member of the team a um, very enthusiastic chap called dominic who goes in and works really closely with um the partners and uh their third party organizations as well so there's like um tours the active well-being society in birmingham and um, the canals and rivers trust and so in, he he helps and we, we help as i'm in and engage all those organizations and then do an outreach and work with the the, the um so sport birmingham in this instance work with them to to do an outreach that works with their operators and their their local providers because i guess every area is slightly different and people have different nuances and want to do it their own way so we work with them to to outreach and, and you know these can be uh, as someone mentioned the um they can be kind of workshops where people come along and drop in sessions and uh, and then they can kind of spill out into, you know, emails and, and we can kind of help uh, upskill in that area. So, yeah, we, we've seen um, a, a good uptake. I, I don't have the numbers to hand of what, you know, the numbers that we're opening up, but we've seen a marked improvement in the amount of people that are providing data in the area, the amount of people that are interested in that are coming and saying, you know, we would like our data here, um, which is great. And that's kind of the end goal. So, yes, it's it's quite an exciting project it's what we try and do in an area when we work with organizations like played go in the area and try and stimulate the um the activities because it's the whole you know we've we've heard it before the chicken and egg what do you focus on opening up the data or serving what's there and if we can do both at the same time then you know we're kind of going to get to that tipping point sooner thanks dom uh jules you've got your hand up i've come to you yeah, it's all right. It may stay raised when I've finished talking because I'm currently driving to work to try and find a Mac that works. How was your day? Anyway, um, I tried to look at the, the audience groups of who's going to put the activities into kind of three main groups. You've got the, the big providers, like the local ones. You've got the communities, which we've just talked about. I'm wondering if the, what there is in terms of the, the middle provision, the, the kind of Sport England system partners, because there's all the NGVs. Have they got... Uh, are they being pushed to open up their activities? I'm assuming that's sort of, um, I'll, I'll handle that one. Um, yeah, yeah. mine, thank you. <laughs> no, of course, no, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, we're, we're encouraging them to do as much as they can uh, and there's a clause in their funding, but it's, um, you know, there's, there's not direct control there. You know, it's not like a leisure franchise. You know, these are clubs that sign up to be part of NGBs. They're not, they're not kind of, um, they're not captured within that remit directly right so it's um so yeah no it's it's I th I th and the thing is none of, none of this is about forcing people to do it right uh, as i think dominic kind of made a good point there uh, and i think actually tom you even made it with with the design of those finders in birmingham you know these things are more successful if people are involved in it from the beginning right and actually if they have a real interest in making it work rather than uh, uh you know yeah wouldn't wouldn't be an approach that sport england would take would be to kind of yeah we wouldn't be forcing this kind of stuff because again, it's that kind of. I was, I'm wondering about is there a mapping? Can we do we know all the NGVs and how many? Because I've seen the No Strings Badminton is mm. has got some of theirs. I know Park Run, uh, a more of a local thing, a local Park Run people can put up their ones. But uh, yeah, I'm just trying to work out how we can get things because someone asked about why isn't Park Run on there? I know Leicester is, but I know nationally they're, you know, they haven't expressed an interest. So I'm just trying to work out how we can reach those who would be having a lot of content that could be ported over quite easily. 
Yeah, there's always a few bigger ones that will unlock quite a lot, isn't there? And I, and um, I would, um, Howard's not on this call, but I would sort of praise the work that Howard has been doing to analyse the feed and look at like who are the biggest publishers and sort of that um, and 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 understand those types of organisations and where there's gaps. Um, so there's, I think, I believe Tim, there's more to follow in terms of what's been shared on that. I mean, initially, uh, David has done a good job with kind of surfacing uh, useful stories from the data we we had from the data feed already. By kind of some of our 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 just sort of comms and engagement through LinkedIn and Twitter, right? But there's more of that story to tell and understand about which operators are doing a lot, which ones aren't doing so much. Um, even things like um, and Barry's not on the call today, but his understanding around uh, the percentage of um, accessible or inclusive um, sessions as well is a really interesting one in itself, right? When you look at that, the the percentage isn't as high as you would think it should be potentially. Um, but yeah, these are all things that I think um, as we, you know, it's all part of building the momentum around this and understanding um, who could make a big difference and, and hopefully get encourage them to be part of it, right? Well, I, th I think there could be some big benefits to just having the conversation at an NGB level. There is varying, we speak to them often and their varying understanding of open active or like some of them, I remember hearing about that a while ago and others are like, doing things about it and I've always kind of said I don't think it needs to be overcomplicated we just need to have a conversation with whoever's um, the most senior person at that organization explain open active what the long-term view is and so when they're acquiring new systems or thinking about things that they're going to do they're not going oh we've just signed this with with this system and if we'd have known this six months earlier we would have looked at an open active approach and that like is for me I think fairly straightforward I don't think there's a ton of organizations and like a, a, an email and a request for a, for a quick meeting just to to get them on side would be fairly straightforward but from coming from us it's a little bit kind of biased or whatever so I, that's why I've always been like this should really be happening from a Sport England open active angle I, good feedback, Tom. We'll take that on board in terms of our, our regular comms and making sure there's good awareness of these initiatives. We're, we're actually doing a bit of a push with system partners on the 21st around all the different digital and data and skills initiatives we have in that space. Um, and actually open active features is one of those things we're, we're sort of trying to rebuild awareness of. Uh, we won't go into a huge amount of depth into like how it all works. But again, hopefully that will kind of stimulate a bit better awareness across NGBs. And then we can either signpost them back into things like this, the AEF, or, um, you know, or do a more in-depth session on Open Active when the time's right. But yeah, no, I think fair, fair feedback there, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Charlie. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, this is a bit of a, I don't want it to be seen as a nosy question, but what, Dom, what I've extrapolated your Birmingham engagement to be there and drop-in sessions is kind of a light version of even this, is a very, uh, almost an example of a data, in, data initiative in us going in in, in a place-based way like the sector does, like hyper-localised and playing consultant to individual organisations to work out for them what their best way of opening their data is to get it onto that local activity finder. Now, if that's working, that's a great story and that's that means we need to repeat and lift that work it's also seemingly on the surface quite labor intensive that doesn't matter if it's working but my question my question there is how's that being funded because if that needs replicating I, I think it crosses over into the policy conversation to me you know we've always talked about oh we just need a line in an agreement and that will help us use it as a vehicle if we're actually saying we need to make sure as funding that that percentages of funding is apportioned like realistically or not I'm putting that to one side like to make sure that resource is being applied to go into those communities in a place-based way and get data open then perhaps that's what's needed whether it's an NGB funding channel or it's an AP funding channel or a particular program so I'm just interested to know how that work is being funded like is it coming out of the, the public or national lottery purse in terms of funding or is it being funded another way to know whether it's repeatable sure um yeah uh a lot of good questions there um and yeah so uh, i think initially um kind of important to say that we, so we work with the sport birmingham so we work with a kind of a, a trio as played uh sport birmingham and, and our part of our remit as well as providing the data is help working with them i think you've kind of said in the consultancy role so you know, we do help them um open up their data and 
I think to, to Adam's point, it's really important to <clears throat> get the buy-in. And so we we go to them, we help them stimulate uh, buy-in themselves. So they go and get the partners. I, I don't know if anyone's seen the Active Birmingham site, but you'll see there's four um, provider, uh, sorry, four logo, logos on there. So the Wellbeing Society, Birmingham City Council, which is a really big one, get them bought in. And if people see their, their logos on things, they're more likely to, um, to remain involved. There is, I think, kind of the, the question you, you're um, posing is kind of the long term sustainability of it. And we do have conversations with them about, you know, how do we make this something that's sustainable in the future? And both in terms of resources, you know, you can't be um, giving someone's time every single day to work with us on this. How do we make this scalable uh, across an area, but also a blueprint for, you know, nationwide? Um, and how do we how do we get it funded? So, you know, you're not working necessarily directly with I'm in the whole time. You know, how do we how do we help you to go to a body and get some funding for this? What does that look like? Does that look like um, a grant of some kind? Do we do we actually look more widely than Sport Birmingham as an organization and look to the city council and other um, you know, equally big organizations? And so, yeah, this is kind of it's an interesting one for us because this is, um, you know, Birmingham is. Uh, was it the second largest city in the country? And and it's a really great place to kind of move out from London and try. And it's, for us, it's kind of, we see it as a very much, a, I guess, kind of a, could form the blueprint going forward. And so if we get this right and we test lots of different ways, you know, hyper-local, as you've, you've pointed out, so really kind of down to the granular level of Dominic, my colleague, talking to um, a badminton club and trying to get them open that data. But a much more higher level of, you know, conversations Nish is having with the city council about, you know, how do we make this a sustainable solution for you and for your organizations? And really kind of, you know, we, we've heard it all before since 2012, but uh, especially in the moment in Birmingham, build on the, the Commonwealth legacy. And there's such a, you know, such an emphasis now to really make that a tangible thing because, you know, questions were asked after 2012 and we want to, you know, we're in all the kind of the pieces and the dominoes are lined up and just, you know, not the first one down. Then hopefully in six months time, 12 months time, we might see kind of a blueprint for how we can get this funded and, you know, others can then replicate that. Thanks, Dom. I think definitely something to uh, to revisit this topic. Um, uh, just conscious of time, but Jules, you've got your hand up. So if I can just come to you for, for a quick last word and then um, we'll leave the last couple of minutes for AOB. <laughs> Uh, well, it's actually AOB, actually. Uh, sorry, I'm driving, so I'm not exactly following right, the great agenda. Great segue, uh, I know. This is what I do. Uh, right, data scraping. And this is something that a lot of people have been asking, saying, well, why should you bother with the finder when everyone goes on Facebook? And we've been contacted by an organisation in Bradford that is effect effectively data scraping, but using it for greater analysis as well, like the HAF project. And I'm wondering just what, possibility there is of actually incorporating public data that is posted elsewhere into open active without necessarily asking them permission that's a good question i'm not sure if it's one we can answer in in two minutes but um i don't yeah, know yeah. to go to on that one i don't know if nick maybe you're the most technically technically uh minded person on the call i don't know if you've got an, an answer for that one uh sure my question would be uh are they doing it legally my suspicion is if you're doing it from Facebook, you're prob possibly not, um, but it depends on uh, it depends on what you mean by data scraping. Um, but I think it's, well, it's, it's, it's there's, yeah, go on. I will dig into it, but obviously anything that's published in the public domain, Google can read it. So Google is effectively scraping data for things like cinema listings. If you Google a film title, it'll tell you where it's showing how much it is. Now, I'm sure that's as much data scraping as anything else. Yeah, there's well, this is this is the point of open data and an open license. An open data and open license means you can literally do anything with the data. Um, and uh, if it's open for um, commercial use and all the rest of it, as all the open data from open active is, um, without such an open license, and the Facebook data won't have an open license, there will be restrictions. Um, so obviously, Google does have snippets on its website that it, it uses and indexes. Um, but but yeah, that I think is 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 probably the the, the murkiness there of of yeah. what commercialization looks like of Facebook's data. For example, does Google index Facebook? It's a good question. I don't know exactly it what doesn't. pages of Facebook are. There we go. It, yeah, it doesn't. It basically, there's a wall around Facebook, wall around most platforms. So if you 
use Google, for example, you can't search content on Facebook. You might be able to search certain elements like people's names and high level information, but you can't search the content on there. Okay, thank you. That's so, so, helpful. So that's, that's why I read yeah, it. So, Absolutely right. So you, the question you've got to ask really is when you're looking at data is, is there an open license associated with this data? And, and if there isn't, there, there, there's probably quite a few restrictions around doing what they're doing legally, depending on what they're doing. There's a fair use, um, the thing legally, there's a fair use thing, you can use it for certain things, um, but that, and in copyright law as well, um, but that is very limited. Um, so yeah, something to keep in mind. Thanks, Tom. That was, yeah, great. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, we're just uh, slightly overrunning, so I think we might have to, to leave it there unless anyone has some very quick uh, AOB they'd like to add. But I'm conscious of not wanting to uh, take up too much of anyone's time. Last, last one, actually, you and, and Tim would be um, at the Open UK conference, which is taking place uh, next week, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, the five o'clock slot is um, on um you know, on open active basically. Uh, and it's a featuring a panel with um, that's being chaired by Andrew Newman, who's the sort of project leader at open active uh, on our open active now. And there's a panel of uh, Nick, who's on the call today, uh, Jade from London Sport and uh, Alison Savage from Sport England. Um, so that is a, t a ticketed event, but I think there are some free tickets going if people if people can request those. Or I think there's also a live feed. Yeah, I, I have a, um, in a, in a, in what would could be deemed a catastrophic part of the marketing strategy, it is available to watch online, which uh, I think uh, runs counter intuitively to actually selling ticket selling tickets. So I think what what we could do with that is get a get a link out after the event starts on Tuesday, so at least people joining it later won't we you know it can't be claimed that we're you know uh, avoiding uh, income on the tickets for that, but we could. Um, we could use the Twitter channel and, and the LinkedIn to post a link to ask people to join us at five o'clock. Brilliant. Thanks when I say that. we could, I mean, I will. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Well, thanks everyone for joining uh, today. I think it's been a really useful meeting and, and definitely some topics that should probably be revisited uh, judging by how much discussion they they um they triggered so really useful um so thanks everyone um enjoy your weekend and enjoy i hope the rest of your day goes okay and hope to see you all in a couple of weeks time